Hello and welcome back to another Energy Exploration. I'm Linnea Lucan, Research Fellow at the Heartland Institute's Arthur B. Robinson Center on Climate and Environmental Policy. In this episode, we're going to look at yet another energy source, this time one that's seen substantial growth over the last few years. Proponents say that it is affordable, environmentally friendly, zero emissions, and I don't know, it can probably go to the moon or something. That energy source is wind, but is that the whole story? First, before we can break down the costs and the efficiency of wind power, I'm going to set some boundaries here. So in this video, I'm mainly discussing the large grid scale wind power plants on land and offshore. So I'm not gonna be talking about your off-grid turbine or a grain mill or anything like that. When you look at data somewhere like in our world of data or different news articles, a lot of the time, what you will see is a data set that is labeled installed capacity. Often, this phrase is being used to mean the combined nameplate capacity of a field of turbines. So that's the amount of energy that can be generated by a field of turbines in ideal conditions. It's not the actual power that's being generated by the wind power plant. It almost never is. Nameplate represents the manufacturer's claim on the peak efficiency of the turbines. This is like when you buy a car. Let's use my car, for example, which is a 2016 Volkswagen GLI. The manual says that I can get 33 miles per gallon on the highway, but more often than not, there's other drivers on the road, so I have to accelerate and to brake, and that messes with your fuel consumption. Additionally, any little issue, maybe I didn't rotate my tires on schedule or get the oil changed right, any number of imperfections in maintenance can also impact the efficiency, and the same is true for wind turbines. Under ideal conditions, and this is usually something like a 30 mile per hour wind speed that is sustained. Um, the optimal wind speed is actually different though, depending on the type of turbine and the size of the turbine blades. So larger rotor blades can make use of a much lower wind speed. And that's the case for a lot of these offshore turbines, which are just huge. Installed capacity is usually calculated by taking that nameplate capacity. So the manufacturer's label, basically, of each turbine at an industrial wind facility, and then you add them all together. This being said, we all know that the wind doesn't blow at a constant speed all the time. So every wind project's actual power output is going to be different. Doing simple math here with numbers from our world in data on installed global wind energy capacity, we can estimate an average capacity factor of about 28.21% worldwide for wind power. The most often cited capacity factor for wind power is going to be about 40%, but as we can see, the actual number is probably quite a bit lower, only occasionally getting anywhere near 40%. So with all that out of the way, we can start talking numbers. So wind energy currently accounts for around 8.8% of net electricity generation in the United States, and worldwide it's about 5.3%. The top three countries with the most wind electricity generation are going to be China, the United States, and Germany, which isn't a huge surprise there. In the United States, installed wind capacity rose 5,477%, and that's between 2000 and 2021, with the greatest number of turbines actually being installed in 2020. Fell off from there, I can't imagine why. Um, so, but what explains that initial rapid increase? So, it would be impossible to claim that this wasn't largely driven by a combination of subsidies given to the industry and state laws that actually mandate the use of electricity generated by wind. States like Michigan, Iowa, California, and Texas have individual renewable portfolio standards, or RPS, that mandate increasing amounts of electricity that is delivered within the state from sources like wind power. Some states and localities also offer tax abatements or property tax reductions for new wind facilities. So the incentives are all there. At the federal level, the Renewable Energy Production Tax Credit offers a tax per kilowatt hour credit for any electricity generated by approved renewable sources like wind. Our friends across the Atlantic also have mandates. For instance, the UK government also requires electricity suppliers to use an increasing amount of renewables generated electricity via the renewables obligation scheme. The mandates are really what set wind and other renewables apart in terms of funding. No traditional energy source, no matter what it is that the proponents say, gets its use mandated by governments in this way. 
because of the subsidies and the mandates, the cost of wind-generated electricity is kept artificially low. There was a study done by the Energy Information Administration that found that offshore wind has the lowest value-to-cost ratio of any new power source, meaning it's way more expensive for not much power output compared to other sources. Most of the time, government agencies and especially the wind turbine companies base their cost analysis and they're comparing it to coal or fossil fuels, not on the actual power generation, but on those idealized capacity factors that I told you about earlier. Onshore wind in particular is way overvalued on paper. So take pretty much any cost analysis you see with a grain of salt and make sure that you double check to see what specific assumptions are being made when generating those numbers. Additional transmission line construction for remote wind power projects, because you're not going to put these things in the middle of downtown Chicago. Um, they're ongoing maintenance and repair, earlier than expected end of life decommissioning, which tends to be the case with a lot of these, and other costs. They also all need to be accounted for when addressing the true cost of electricity generated by wind turbines. And it is crazy hard to find legitimate numbers on any of those um, options there. It's increasingly frustrating when you're trying to do research on it and there's just nothing to be found. The benefits of wind power for the environment itself are also kind of open to question too. Sure, if all you're worried about is carbon dioxide, they emit none at the point of generation, so, you know, there's that. Uh, however, they still do need a backup power source that more often than not is going to be a net emitter. And don't forget, these things are made with a lot of cement, which accounts for about 8% of the world's carbon dioxide emissions. But that's not really my focus here. The most obvious environmental impacts from industrial wind development is going to be its impacts on land, people, and animals. Wind-powered electricity displaces far more land than solar, nuclear, or fossil fuels when you look at each source and break down their construction, the mining involved, and the eventual installation. One study by Strata Policy found that a 1,000 megawatt wind power plant would require 133 square miles of land, while something like nuclear would only use 1.3 square miles. Wind is by far and away the most land-hungry energy source. This is especially true when you consider the fact that the turbine blades actually can't be recycled and end up in special landfills, which there are only a handful of them that can take the materials. It's also not the case that all land is great for wind energy. Most ideal locations are going to be filled first. As the best positions for wind generation are filled, for new wind facilities to produce the same amount of energy, even more land and more turbines are needed. There's a catch there too, and that's something called the braking effect that is observed in very large turbine fields. So the power output of wind facilities that are downwind neighboring wind power plants can be reduced by 20% or more. So that's an additional 20% on top of the already low capacity factor. Large wind facilities also can disrupt radar stations and make flying aircraft nearby hazardous. Birds are special victims of wind turbine blades. Fans of wind energy like to claim that it's not a big deal. While you will go to jail and pay hefty fines just for possession of one bald eagle feather, wind power facilities are given special permission in the form of a take limit to kill bald and golden eagles. There may also, and this isn't talked about a whole lot, but may be some health effects on humans as well when large fields of turbines are sighted too close to where people live. The constant infrasound and low-frequency noise, as well as nighttime blinking lights and daytime turbine flicker, have been claimed to cause health issues like sleeplessness, headaches, and even some heart problems. The noise issue might also be a problem offshore, and there is some indication that this kind of noise might affect migrating whales nearby and cause them to beach themselves. While it is true that wind turbines don't directly emit carbon dioxide while generating power, there are obviously a lot of questions to consider before accepting them as a larger source of energy. The major issue is the intermittency. So when the wind dies down, or is blowing too hard actually, no power is generated. That can't be controlled. So they can't be used to supply baseload power to the grid. On top of that, they're more expensive than we've been led to believe and a lot more environmentally damaging. All energy sources are going to carry a degree of risk and risk to the natural world as well. The only thing that we can do is balance the positives and the negatives. 
What seems clear, though, is that if we want consistent, reliable energy with as little impact as possible on the environment, mandating increased use of wind power arguably doesn't make all that much sense. Hi guys, hope you liked the video. Please come check us out. Um, you can read a bunch of articles that we write every single day at climaterealism.com. If you like the video, well, you know the drill.